two different types of dogs but a really pleasant and unusual surprise out here on cheetah plains in the form of a namaqua dove the smallest dove that we get out here and one of the most elusive the only place we really see them is cheetah plains so this is actually quite a special bird and it's a really nice one for you to add to your bird lists even though our birding competition only starts this afternoon I just had to show you this particular Namaqua dove because well most of the time they don't even sit still long enough for us to get them on camera so the fact that we've been sitting with this one for as long as we have is a treat indeed so tiny tiny little dove in comparison to the laughing dove which is off to the right there's the laughing dove over there that's a pretty common sight to see and cheetah plains is in fact the land of the laughing dove there are so many around here but a namaqua dove particularly a beautiful male like this one with his black markings around his face and the fact that he sat still this long is a rare sight indeed a much smaller but with a very very elongated tail the longest tail of the doves that we see out here we see ringneck doves we see laughing doves but we never ever see namaqua doves now, while we're watching them pecking away Brittany you want to know what the doves are eating grass seeds at this time of year there's lots and lots of them around most of them in these open areas have been stripped away by the cysticulars but there's still a little bit on the road and that's why the two doves are hanging out on the fringes it's a nice open spot for them so they've got plenty of opportunity to see a predator advancing on them Your roads come in useful for a lot of different species out here but at the same time they're also warm they're the first bits to sort of heat up on a cool day or a cool morning like this morning and there it goes pecking along so the smallest dove species that we get out here and a rare one for your bird list I bet that's a new one for quite a few of you let's quickly show you the difference between a male and a female oh, I had it on the right page there we go there we go at the bottom that's the male obviously on the right that's the one that we've been looking at and the female on the left without those dark markings around her face beautiful very 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 small smaller even than the emerald spotted wood dove if you don't count the tail just in terms of body size see if we'll catch up with it since it's being so obliging let's try and get a bit closer oh my goodness Tristan's having all the luck from large creatures on foot to now a scaly one. We are having so much luck. So we came down from the termite mound to get away from the ellies. And as you can see here, there is a little track that is developing. Now this track is from a slithery writhing creature that is sitting just off to my right hand side. So there we go. You can see that we've got a giant legless skink that is here and is busy moving around. Now these guys are burrowers and are not venomous in any way we don't have to worry about them so that's why we're sitting so close and not too stressed and this little snake is basically warming up on the road it's getting some sunshine that's coming out and then is going to move now the reason we spotted it is because it's sitting right in the middle of the road and it's just sort of taking it very easy I can promise you it is alive as you can see by the tracks these tracks are on top of Byron's vehicle this is where Byron drove just now with the elephant so these are on top of his vehicle so they definitely definitely is alive it's crossed while he was sort of at the hyena den and so he's still just taking it easy and it's probably trying to stay still as a defense mechanism so Brian you say don't we worry about stepping on a snake while we're on bushwalk well there's only one snake really out here that you have to worry about stepping on or two actually and those are both adder species so one is the puff adder and the other one is the night adder because those two there we go hello did you just see us and as they're not very good with their vision they need their tongue to taste what's going on so I think it's just realized that there's a camera watching it hello you're a celebrity now you're on TV well done um, 
And so, yes, the puff adder and the, the night adders, you've got to be very careful. They're actually responsible for a number of bites in Africa because they don't move when you walk. Most snakes, when you're walking, will move away, particularly the venomous, venomous ones. So things like cobras, mumbers, um, berm slungs, which is an Afrikaans word for a tree snake, um, they're all venomous. And generally, when they sort of pick up your vibrations, they try and get out of that area because they can feel that we're a big animal approaching and they don't want to get hurt, and so they try and move out of the way. Um, the problem with puff adders is that they're an ambush predator and, and same with the night adder and so they sit and actually wait when they pick up vibrations because they want to be able to get whatever is coming that way and so often you then end up standing on them and then out of a defense mechanism they strike so yes we are concerned about snakes but the nice thing about a puff adder is as the name suggests is that it puffs so it makes this sound as you kind of get close to it and then you know that okay there's something here and you just stop moving and you look around you and you can generally spot them so you've got to be a little bit careful when you're walking and check where you're walking I think that's one of the first rules of the bush is always be aware of your surroundings and watch where you walk so you not only do you have to look out for big things like the elephants that we saw just now you've got to look out for these little guys So Daniel, all the way from Scotland. Hello Daniel, I hope you're having a wonderful morning in Scotland and that it's not grey and rainy and you say this is your first snake that you've seen on Bushwalk. Well, I'm glad that we can show you one. They really are incredible creatures. Now this little blind snake is a termite and anteater, so that's what it will eat and so it's not really anything that we need to worry about. But you can see how it moves. It doesn't have a very fast motion and unfortunately for this snake is it actually can't spend too much time out like this because there's many a bird that will want to go after them and because they're slow sluggish moving creatures they're going to get themselves into trouble. So what it's going to try and do is going to get into the grass and you can see this coloration is perfect for camouflage so once it's into the grass it becomes quite difficult to spot and it's actually got the most beautiful pattern it almost looks like a rope and it's got these kind of little markings all over it and once it's then into the grass it can sort of move a little bit slower and then they'll find an area where the ground's quite soft and they'll burrow in there or they'll make use of a termite mound but it's a really special thing to see it might actually mean an indication that rain might be coming that they're moving So, Megan, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. I know that you said Jono and evolutionary species, but if you can repeat that for me. So, Jono, this is an interesting question because, as we were saying, it's a, it's a legless skink, so it's kind of between a snake and a skink skink and you want to know are they a link between sort of evolutionary species well I suppose they are um, they do come from kind of lizards so you do get some skinks that will actually have two little legs protruding off the side of the body um, so they have those kind of lizard like legs and then you get these guys that have no legs and are more snake like so I suppose they are a link to between the snakes and the skinks um, I'll have to do a bit more research to check and actually see what their lineage is and what they sort of define them as whether they define more as a snake or a skink and whether or not there is a link between the two of them you might find that there is slight differences that means that they're in a different family altogether but it is possible indeed now we're going to move off the road because we have some guests that are coming down and we are blocking their way so while we do that let's go back to Byron who's left the hyena den is now search for other animals as he goes along so we've just left that hyena den those little hyena actually moved off they follow, followed the adult away but I think they just might have gone through some long grass and they're probably going to return back there shortly I don't think they're going to stay away for very long but lovely view of them though nice to see them suckling out in the open there's a lot of hyena tracks along the road yeah all over at the moment that I can see and we're going to see what else we can find this morning been a lovely morning so far it sounds like Tristan's had so much luck more luck than anyone else this morning seeing some interesting tracks over here hang on let me jump out and show you ah. no, let me jump out here I think I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> uh, can you see this line in the sand over here? And tracks of 
an animal that has obviously walked along here. Now this looks like a rather large water monitor or rock monitor that has moved along here. Hold on a second. Hang on. I can see a leopard track here too. Oh, it just shows you. So there's a very clear leopard track over here. Here's the leopard track. Over there. So I'm going to try to follow where that goes shortly. And, um, and then this is the monitor lizard going that way. But let's see. Let me just jump on again quickly. Try to get an update from the ladies. Nice to see those different tracks though, um, between, well, firstly the monitor lizard and then this leopard track. I'm going to try to find out where this track's going. Um, it looks like a female leopard, that's interesting, so I'm going to try and have a good look, see how fresh it is and where it's going. But Jamie's got a very endangered bird she'd like to show you. There's nothing I love to see more than a thriving group of ground hornbill. So we've made our way onto the vast open area of cheetah plains in the hope of cheetah, but we found another endangered species instead. And look at this incredible view that we have of them. <laughs> One head popping up every now and again. I can actually see, or I did see, four of them. I think there's five in this particular group. But it's always special whenever we encounter these incredibly endangered birds. Roughly turkey sized, maybe a little bit larger. And as Byron said, they are a species that has struggled over the last few years or the past few decades. I wanted to show you from afar, but we'll try and get a little bit closer. I was just worried they were going to fly away if we tried to get too much closer. But let's try now, now that you've had a chance to see them moving about in the grass, looking for grubs and other such insects. Snakes, a blind snake like the one that Tristan had. Oh, sorry, it wasn't. It was a legless skink would definitely be on the menu for a ground hornbill. Let us see if we can find a slightly better vantage point. I'm also hoping, judging by the activity of the Mala Mala vehicles to the south, I'm also hoping there might be some cheetah around. And on a nice cool day like today, Tristan did say that they're quite full-bellied, or they were full-bellied when he saw them yesterday, but I'm hoping they might decide to come back in this direction. There should be an off-road track somewhere here. I don't want to drive across this open area and create tire tracks all the way through. It's something that we only really do if there's something like cheetah or leopard or one of those creatures. Otherwise we try and avoid creating off-road tracks, particularly since they'll be very visible on this open area and do substantial damage to the environment. So we're not going to do that. Here we go. Here's our ground hornbill. Now this family, oh, got something. Perhaps a dung beetle of some kind. This family consists of a male and a female and they're almost adult offspring. And then a, a slightly younger one that is still at that yellowish phase where their face is a little bit yellowish rather than the bright red color of a fully mature ground hornbill. And of course it takes them seven to eight years to reach sexual maturity so it's quite an extended period for a bird and generally speaking your birds of prey or your ground hornbills they take a little bit longer than other species to reach adulthood and fascinatingly enough i've said that they've got some almost fully grown offspring with them that is part of the way in which ground hornbills function and in fact they have shown or studies have shown that ground hornbills struggle to be successful parents unless they have actually practiced their babysitting skills on a, a, a sort of a sibling group or a younger generation. If they don't have that experience they struggle to breed successfully. It's one of the reasons for their decline in numbers and one of the reasons why the massive reintroduction and breeding program of ground hornbills has to has to kind of put in an artificial situation where 
sub-adults can care for younger generations. Now, Tim, you want to know what is causing the stress on the ground hornbills? Why are their numbers declining? A reduction in habitat is a big one, just because, of course, as human beings, we have a tendency to take over, and it's resulted in a loss of habitat for ground hornbills. Another reason, I'm going to try and go round so that we can see them from the opposite side. Another reason is use in traditional medicine, so poaching, essentially. And then there's also the situation where, like their yellow-billed and their red-billed cousins, they have a tendency to hammer on windows. Now, our yellow-billed and our red-billed hornbills attack our vehicles on a regular basis. They go and they sit on the wing mirrors and tap their reflection. Or they attack our windows of our bedrooms. And that's all fine and well for the little hornbills, the little hornbill species. But a big, powerful bird like a ground hornbill has... This is the track I was looking for has a tendency to break glass, which doesn't make them very popular in local communities where money is very much in short supply and smashed windows are not looked upon very favorably. And it might be hard for us as animal lovers to understand, but I do understand it. When you don't know that it's an endangered species, when you don't know how precious they are, all, all you've seen is, is a pest smashing windows. One, two, three, four, five of them. That's what I was worried about getting closer. Quite shy, this group. They've all taken off into the trees. Nicely done, Dave. And a lack of suitable nesting sites as well. Ground hornbill, like pandas, are very picky breeders. They only like to nest in one place, and if that gets destroyed, it takes them a long time to find themselves a new and suitable nest site. Our hornbills have disappeared into the trees. Let's go across to an animal that would be able to look them in the eye. Well, we have gotten closer to the giraffe, so we waited for quite a while with our little legless skink, and the giraffe sneaked up behind us. So you can see they're all standing here watching us. And remember what I was saying earlier about how their eyesight is so good. So you can see everybody's kind of watching, and look at how close they've come. I don't know why the animals today are being so kind to us, but they really are all being very close. Generally, giraffe have got such good eyesight that they wouldn't come as close as these guys have come. But for some reason today, everybody's being very trusting of us, and we're getting these incredible views on foot. And Rex and I were actually just talking about it. If you are a guest and you've come out here and you're watching this and you think that every bush walk is like this, there's no ways. We got, must do probably 50 walks to be able to then experience a walk like we've had this morning. So, yeah, absolutely amazing. Now, we're going to go back to Jamie because we've got a few gremlins, so we're going to quickly reboot. And while we do that, we'll get to Jamie and we'll come back just a little bit just now. Well, they fight off the gremlins fiercely. I'm doing a scan of the southern section of Mala Mala because I can see a vehicle there and I also heard a wildebeest giving its alarm call, which makes me think these cheetah are still around here. Here's the Mala Mala vehicle. And they all seem to be looking down to the right of their vehicle and I suspect that's, sorry, I'm, I meant there, right? There, the, that left. Yeah. I suspect that's where the cheetah are. So, essentially a kilometer away. We've got a nice view of a bush. We've got a blurry view of a bush, let's, let's be frank. At full zoom. And if I shift around in the car too much, it becomes a jiggly blurry view of a bush. Oh well. We tried. We tried for luck. I'm going to lurk here though. It's cool. They're full bellied, but it's nice and cool this morning. There's a chance those cheetah brothers might decide to come back here. Look, I don't know if it's the cheetah. It could be a leopard, for all I know. It could be a pangolin, although I think that the activity might be slightly more enthusiastic from that vehicle if it were a pangolin. Ah, oh, Dave. <sighs> I have to concede this. I'm going to send you back across to Tristan, who yesterday had two cheetah and two leopards on cheetah planes.
we did indeed we got very spoiled as we are this morning you can see the giraffe is still behind us and the zebra and i have no idea why they're being so close to us they've kind of become interested and they're walking right towards us now i wonder if these aren't some members of the mccurdy herdy and the zebra side of things and that's why they relaxed but the giraffe for some reason are not concerned by our presence at all it really is quite strange i've never actually spent time with giraffe in the sabi sands this close generally when we walk towards them they tend to move off but i'm going to just try and sneak up towards this big marula tree and then we can watch them crossing the road in front of us but it really is an amazing morning that we've been having as we negotiate the bush we've become across so many different things this morning it's almost a bit surreal and this is how it sometimes goes i i know where jamie is at the moment she's battling a little bit to find a few animals and it does happen that way you get these times where you find things and it becomes almost easy to see animals and then you go through phases where you can't find anything and I remember James last week was having a similar struggle to what Jamie's having right now and don't worry Jamie your luck will change with something spectacular I can tell you so hopefully Jamie's luck does change now these giraffe are right here so I'm going to try and go towards the marula tree and hide behind the marula tree and we can then see the giraffe from there but this is so so special now you'll see that the little ones might move off slightly but I'm hoping that they'll stop on the road here and we'll be able to see them but isn't this so cool this is absolutely amazing now a giraffe on foot while it is a common animal and it doesn't have that sort of danger factor that you get with an elephant where you kind of feel like you've got to be very careful a giraffe still is just so amazing it's such an odd looking animal and just to see how tall they are when you're standing next to them at this distance is really quite something you'll see the male's going to come out now and i'm hoping he's going to go towards that termite mound because once these giraffe move off i'm going to go stand at the termite mound and i'll ask seb to stay exactly where he is now so you can see the difference between the size of the giraffe and the size of me when I'm standing next to that um, termite mound so we'll see now now he's just coming out the male I can see him just around the corner here he's just watching me from there but hopefully he's going to come out he is a beautiful individual looks like a fairly young male his ears are all in good condition his neck area there's no visible scarring and his ossicones also still quite um, thin and narrow they haven't really developed that much just yet so he's still younger male but isn't he spectacular absolutely amazing come see him let's go so susan yes we can tell by their horns if they're male and female remember well, it's not horns but they're called ossicones now a male will have very thick very big ossicones that are bald on top whereas a female has very thin very narrow hairy topped ossicones and that's how we can tell the difference between the two now I am right on the road but I want to try something so Sebastian and I were talking about it just now that it would be so nice if we could sit on the road and get a sort of road's eye view of these giraffes so Sebastian I think let's sit down and see if these giraffe maybe start coming a little bit closer to us sometimes giraffe are quite curious and when we sit like this they might actually come closer but it also gives you a much better perspective of their height look at that isn't that amazing absolutely incredible to spend time with these guys like this so so cool you can also hear the elephants still feeding just behind us here so they're not too far away now i'm hoping the male is going to come out a little bit further so we can really get a sort of impression of his size but what is very clear as you can see the female on the left her ossicones are very very narrow very small and that is quite a big female she's probably not fully grown just yet but she's an adult and she will be mating already but then if you go to the right and you see the size of the male in comparison how much taller he is he's probably about a meter taller than what she is now giraffe males will get to about four and a half meters tall and a giraffe female about three and a half meters so Sebastian's saying he's struggling to find the male a little bit but he's the one on the far right just his head poking out of the bush there a little bit so just trying to guide Sebastian as to where he is okay, 
So African bush lover, they are indeed. The spots of a giraffe are unique to every single individual. You'll see just amongst these sort of giraffe that we see here, every single one has a different pattern on their flanks and neck areas. So it's exactly like the fingerprint of a human. They all have unique patterns. And that's how the babies actually recognize their mother. So when they give birth, they'll segregate from the herd slightly and the baby then learns that that is mom. And over time, you'll find that they eventually learn the patterning and they can go to mom and find milk. So yes, every single one is different, much like the zebras. Now I'm hoping the zebras are going to make an appearance now now as well. But isn't this spectacular? A ground eye view of giraffe. It just makes them look so much bigger and so much grander by being down low like this. It's such a special morning we've had. Absolutely amazing. You can see how interested they are in us. Giraffe are always very curious animals. They like to sit and look and stare and see what is this odd thing that is sitting on the road watching us. And they're also trying to make sure that we're not something that's going to eat them. So they sit and they look and they watch. And when you get to a point where you're just a little bit too close, then they'll start moving away from you. And they know the distance that they can then escape from where you are. So they run at quite a, quite a fast speed. They'll do about 60 kilometers an hour. And so they know from here, if I had to get up and run at them, they would be able to cover the ground to get away and get far enough from danger that they wouldn't have to worry. There we go. They're slowly but surely coming out for us, which is absolutely amazing. And I'm wondering if maybe one or two of them might even come a little bit closer just to see what we're doing. But isn't this special? And it's amazing because we don't generally spend too much foot time on foot with giraffe normally because they're quite sort of shy they tend to move off a little bit and they're not really interested in sticking around look at the little baby looking at us the little baby's just not too sure about this it's kind of following the lead of everybody else but it's not convinced that it should be sitting so close to whatever's lying on the road the two young ones together there So Crispin, you're wondering, is it true if the baby will retain some pattern from the mom? Well, in my experience, no, I've never actually noticed that. It might be possible, but I've never read anything about it. I've never seen it in real life, so I don't think so. Um, it could be possible, but I really, really don't think so. Um, they tend to all have very unique patterns. You can see these two young ones, they have got the, a very different pattern to even that female on the left. Now I'm sure that female on the left is the mother of one of these and the patterning on her is already darker. You can see on her sort of chest area that it's quite sort of block-like pattern, or not block-like, so they're very irregular pattern, sorry, whereas the, the little one to the right of her has got more block-like patterns, so it doesn't look at all similar. So I don't think so. Um, I've never, like I say, noticed it, and I've never read anything about it, so I don't think that is true. But you see, they're actually starting to ruminate now, so they're actually quite comfortable with us being here. They're not too worried that we're sitting here. If they were worried, you'd find they wouldn't be feeding at all. So even though they are watching, they're still regurgitating balls and are happy enough to start chewing and watch us while they do that. It is an advantage that prey animals do have. So a lot of the prey animals are ruminating animals. And so for those of you who don't know what ruminating is, ruminating is basically an animal that has a four-chambered stomach that is able to regurgitate the food that it's previously fed on. So if they've eaten leaves early hours of this morning, they're now regurgitating those balls of leaves out of the stomach and they're then chewing them to process that leaf even more and the reason why they do that is because a giraffe being the sort of shape that it is its body is actually quite small its legs and neck are very very big but its body is quite small so it doesn't have a huge space in there for a large sort of vat like stomach that you'd see on something like an elephant or a buff um a hippo and so what it has to do is it has to be able to maximize every bit of nutrients out of what it does feed on and so this system allows them to regurgitate and reach you and maximize all the nutrients out of that leaf what it also allows is for them to spend less time feeding it means they can spend time like this where they can watch a potential predator but still gain nutrients from it and keep themselves alive so it's a very effective system if you're a prey species now we're going to sit and enjoy these giraffe and spend some more time with them because this is just absolutely fantastic and sitting on a road watching giraffe in the morning is really something that is quite special and while we do that i believe Jamie is still on cheetah planes and she doesn't have a predator this time but she does have one of the most beautiful antelope in Africa. Absolutely beautiful indeed. Speaking of ruminants, here is another one. 
from the giraffe to the relatively lot necked kudu. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Try not to breathe and speak and swallow at the same time. Now oh, we've just been treated to such a wonderful sighting of these two kudu calves. They're playing, which is one of my favorite things to watch all animals do because there's something light-hearted and gentle about it and very relatable. Look at the two of them. They've been chasing each other up, down, round and round, up termite mounds, down termite mounds. And the two of them are exactly the same age, exactly the same size. And unlikely that they're twins. They might just be friends. And how wonderful it must be to be a young antelope to have a friend that can keep you entertained. They've been dashing backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. I'm hoping they're going to continue to do that because it's... <coughs> Dave and I are both coughing now. Let us catch up with our antelope friends. Or not. Or they could just be gone. Oh no, there they are. But further than I realized. Here we go. Where'd the little ones go? hiding in the back there. There they are. I'm not sure if it's a bomber girl or bomber girl. Dave, it's raining. Oh, yuck. <laughs> that was unexpected. Sorry, a bomber girl. Ooh, bumbo. Bumbo. Well, you'll know who you are. You'll know who you are. You want to know how closely Inyala and Kudu are related. Very closely. Um, they're part of the same tribe known as the spiral horned antelope family, which includes Bushbuck, Inyala, Kudu, Iland, Sitsatunga, which is an antelope that we definitely won't see around here. I'm just putting my camera away while it's because I don't want it to get too wet. So they are very closely related to each other. And in fact, in terms of evolution, Anala is slightly more recent as a species than a kudu and very recent to this area. They've actually essentially been introduced in places like this. Introduced by human beings keen on enjoying their beauty. They probably would have got here regardless, but it would have taken them a lot longer. <coughs> so both in the Trafalagus genus. Spiral horned antelope family. What is this, a cloud burst? No, look, it's properly coming down. This is ridiculous. I was not expecting this. Of course, any rain is positive at this time of year. But it does mean that we have to do some covering up. So while we do that, let's go and enter into a staring competition between Tristan and a giraffe. Indeed. Isn't this amazing? Isn't that the most unique perspective of an animal? Very, very seldom do we get to see what it's like to look up at a giraffe from sort of a lion's perspective. Now you can imagine if we were lions stalking, this is what we would be seeing. We would be down on the ground like this, trying to stay as low as possible, and we'd be watching these massive individuals towering over us. So this is just so incredibly cool. And even Seb and I were both loving this, and Rex behind me is also smiling from ear to ear because we've been absolutely spoiled by animals. Now I know Jamie says it's raining down on Cheetah Plains. Well, we've been having rain of our own here and it's raining animals on Juma this morning. We've really been spoiled so it's been absolutely spectacular. And I was actually just looking behind us to the east. It does look quite ominous. So hopefully not going to get wet here on Bushwalk because we don't exactly want to get wet with our equipment. So we'll have to watch that carefully. But for now we're kind of engrossed and um, watching these giraffe and the giraffe are watching us too and you can see there's Rexon he's taking it very very easy behind us and he's all smiles and happy days and waving 
So Rex is in his very chilled mode as he is and he's making sure that the reason why he's sitting behind us is he's making sure that the elephants don't actually come from that way while we enjoy our giraffe sighting. So it's very cool to have Rex with us. Rex is always such a pleasure to be with on bushwalk because he's got such a vast knowledge of the area and he's the most sort of calm character. <clears throat> it really is quite special to be with him. And funny enough, we were talking earlier, I know you were just, we were chatting with Jamie about Inkanyeni and what her name means. Well, Rex was telling me the whole sort of history of Inkanyeni, where she comes from. Now, when I first moved to the Sabi Sands, she, her mother was still alive, which was the beacon female. And her beacon female used to hang around in southern Manuleti, northern Biffles Hook, and sometimes into Buyatela. And in Kanyeni, when she was born, apparently, used to just love marula trees, and so that's why they named her after a marula tree, so she used to spend all her time in there, and that's where she got her name from. So Rex was telling me all the sightings that he's had of her from when she was a little cub all the way through to now. So it really is quite amazing to have that kind of wealth of knowledge and to sit and walk through the bush like this and, and, and speak to somebody like that is just such a value-added sort of asset for us as guides, and we learn so much from both him and Herbie. Now, like I say, we're not going to move from here because these giraffe are just so spectacular and I'm just loving spending so much time with them. Now, we're going to stay and watch and while we do, I believe there's another knowledgeable character out here who at least tells us he's knowledgeable and that's the big boss, Byron. <laughs> Tristan, you make me laugh. Now, I've just decided to stop here at this dam with the hippo. <laughs> there he is. He's watching us carefully. And he might be a little jealous because we have decided to stop for our coffee break. So Senzo is enjoying a nice cup of coffee with me. Thank you to the flask, which I bring with. <laughs> um, now, earlier when I saw you, I had tracks of the monitor lizard and then I said I saw tracks of a leopard and looked like a female. It was actually, so it was, um, I had a closer look, it was a back pad of a male leopard and further down the road I could see some clearer tracks and it was a, a male leopard but now I think what's possibly happened is it was a male leopard that may have crossed through our property. I'm just thinking back, earlier we saw tracks of a, a male leopard crossing um, towards the west, uh, towards Mambili, and I think that male leopard possibly walked through all the way up here and cut straight through and I wouldn't be surprised if it was in Tingana. I kind of know more or less his movements generally. Again, you, I never assume that we know leopard movements, but they tend to mark certain areas quite, quite regularly. There's a bit of a drizzle coming now. That's interesting. So I think it was him that walked right through during the course of the night. I just wanted to show you something quickly. I have, I have a new book. And this is a beautiful book. A wonderful tracking book. Just with tracks and signs that you can find in the wild. But here is a lovely image and description of the, um, the tracks that we saw. The monitor lizards in the feet. And you can see the clear tail mark in the sand. And here they actually show it in the sand, just to the right of the page over here. There we go. There you can see that very clear tail mark through the sand, and then they show you the footprints. Sometimes how difficult it can be to see the prints. But, um, and then they describe the tracks. So this, I think those tracks that we saw were of the water monitor, just because there's a little water hole nearby. So I think it was possibly a water monitor that moved through that area. And the rock monitors tend to be, I mean, you'll find them out there too, but I'm just guessing, I mean, the tracks look almost identical, so, which is quite, uh, quite nice. Um, so that's my new tracking book, which I got, which is great. Always nice to have an additional book with you. Alright, well, it's starting to rain, so I'm going to enjoy my coffee and a biscuit while I do. It sounds like Tristan's leaving some tracks in the sand.
have indeed. I was leopard crawling my way towards these giraffes just to see how close I could get before they noticed me. And you can see that they're still watching. They moved off slightly, but they are still watching. It was quite funny just to watch. I'm sure the girls in final control had a good laugh as I was trying to drag myself along the road. You can see here where we came along and then turned around. But it's amazing, actually, funny enough, the zebra were the ones that gave me away. They were the ones that started huffing and puffing. They're just off to the side. Now, I think we've probably had enough with these giraffes. It is starting to rain, so we're going to have to probably try and cover up the backpack quickly. So rather than messing around with giraffe and getting our equipment all wet, well, let's try and see if we can't just get our covers on and make sure that everything's okay. Whoops, yeah, I gave the giraffe a bit of a fright. I'm naughty. They must have thought I was a lion getting up with my beard. Now, I just want to go towards Rex to get the backpack so that I can, I mean, all the rain covers, so that I can cover our backpack up. Right, so while we do this, I believe Jamie's still on Cheetah Plains and she's got her rain covers on and is all waterproof. So let's go across to her and see how she's doing. The sun is shining down upon us is how we're doing, which is lovely, makes for a nice change. It's actually a monkey's wedding. The rain is still falling, but the sun is shining. And we did go into several different ways in which you can say monkey's wedding and all sorts. What was it? It was the Afrikaans one day. I was with you, wasn't I? Yuck, something to do with a yuckle and a wolf. Something about jackal marrying wolf's wife. Yakul throw met wolf sofro. That was it. Afrikaans term for a monkey's wedding. Jackal marries wolf's wife. Or a term for, or an expression for when it's raining but the sun is shining. Makes for a very, very pretty atmosphere. It would be even prettier if Nkanyeni were just, you know, here, somewhere. As it starts to get warmer, my my thinking initially this morning was that if I were a leopard, I wouldn't want to be lying in dewy grass. That was my thinking. I would want to be either out in the open on a termite mound, or maybe even lying on a road. But that doesn't seem to be the case. One last check where Inkanyeni was. You never know, we might get lucky. If she has cubs, because there's some debate about that, if she does have small cubs, she might have gone to go and feed them and then come back to her kill. I don't see any sign of the kill being in a tree, so she may have lost it. Let's go very slowly around here. Check the marula trees. The grass is so long she could be lying 20 meters away from us and we'd struggle to see her, which is why I was hoping, against hope, that she was going to be out and visible. Unlike Tristan, who apparently is leopard crawling at giraffe. Sounds like he's had a joyous bushwalk. Check all the trees carefully. So the kill was just ahead here. I didn't see any drag marks, but I don't know how much of it was left. So if hyenas did come through and steal it, they might have consumed all of it in one go. Morning, Kanyeni. One last drive past. Third time lucky, Dave. Yep. Now, speaking of termite mounds, we all know that leopards use termite mounds as a very useful vantage point. But Rebecca, you want to know whether or not a leopard will ever use a termite mound as a den. Yes, occasionally. It's quite rare for them to do so. Shadow actually denned not this cub, but the last set of cubs in a termite mound hollow. So it does happen. They also like to use culverts in the road, which is what both Shadow and Karula have done in the past. Culverts on the main road. That seems to be where they like to put their dens. Here's the off-road tracks to where she was. One last quick check. So it is possible they prefer rocky outcrops, cre crevices in rocks, overhangs. One of the places that Karula used when she first gave birth was a, 
a root system where the soil had washed away so she could actually hide her cubs underneath there. Is there a leopard on this termite mound? Come on, Inkanyeni. No. There is not. Oh well. Worth a try. Worth a try. Guess third time lucky. Didn't pay off. She might be on the road in front of us. You never know. Well, since my luck appears to be non-existent this morning, let's go and see whether Byron's is any better. Um, not necessarily, Jamie. We haven't found much just yet. It's funny how the weather has changed. All of a sudden it's become quite chilly. There was a few drops of rain. Quite, quite big clouds. I don't think it's going to rain though. It seems to be breaking up already. So maybe just a little, little front that came through. I'm still curious about that leopard that walked through, but I do think it was that male that walked through the whole property, a um, more portion of the property. Just makes sense the way it was heading, the direction it was heading. Elephant dung. No, it looked like this monitor lizard has walked all along the road here. Um, you can just see that every now and then I see parts of the tail that have crossed through the road. So we did see those tracks initially just a bit further down. So he has walked all along the road here. He or she. And they will do that, especially the water monitors. They will move from one water hole to the other from time to time. They need to look for food, perhaps a, a nesting site. They do bury their eggs. Now, all I would really like to happen is that we drive around and we scan the trees and we see a beautiful leopard lying in the tree. I haven't seen that for quite some time. So, and it's always wonderful when you drive. It doesn't happen often. When I mean, you're just driving and spot a leopard lying in the tree, it is a great, uh, <laughs> it's a great feeling. I still get excited. It doesn't matter what it is actually. It doesn't matter if it's a leopard or not, but just finding an animal. If you find tracks or you spot something or you track something down, it's uh, it's very exciting and I still really really enjoy it. A nice cool day. What little bird is that? Is that a little emerald spotted wood dove just on this little dead tree? Let's just have a look here quickly. It is indeed and it's a beautiful view of it. You see the emerald spotted wood dove. It's sitting nice in the open. Unfortunately, there's no light really hitting it, so you can't see those those little emerald specks on the on the wing. You can just see it there. Beautiful little dove. Anyway, from that dove, there we go. Uh, can you see the emerald? Uh, not really, it's not really getting enough light on it to see it. But it is a beautiful little dove. Lovely little markings on the back there. Well, nice to see another bird. I'm going to add it to my list that we're on about four or five that we've seen on camera, and I'll just use those this afternoon, I think. Uh, let's head to Tristan, who I think has got the same leopard tracks that I saw earlier. I think he might be around those now.
well they're not the same ones Byron but these are the leopard tracks for whoever was calling at the dam last night and from these tracks we can determine exactly who it was now earlier I hypothesized that it would be Tingana's tracks or Tingana that was at the dam and it is indeed these are the tracks for a large male leopard and we are on Weaver's Nest Road and that is exactly where Tingana walks when he comes through here so this is his normal route and it looks like his tracks it's big enough to be his now you might see that I've got a whole bunch of grasses here but what I wanted to show you and why I made such a big block is because this is a perfect example of back and front foot and what's interesting about this is that this shows that this leopard was moving fast he was not walking slowly because when they walk slowly this front foot here we would have had the back foot right on top of the front foot okay there's a normal gait where they do this um, where the one the back foot lands on the front foot if they're walking normally when they're walking very fast the back foot overtakes the front foot slightly in the track and they then carry on so he was on a very 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 quick mission what I want to also want to show you is just the size difference between these two and the only way to really do that is through the grass because I'm going to put overlay the back foot with the front foot so that you can see that the back foot is a similar length but what I want you to look at is the width of the track so this is from toe to toe now if I put from toe to toe here on the front foot sorry just gonna move that across you can see look at how much wider his front foot is than his back foot so often you ask how we know the difference between front and back foot and there you can see it this front foot is very very wide and it almost forms a circular shape to it whereas the back foot is more of an oval shape and you can see much much more slender and narrow and the other reason why we know this is a leopard is because it has the three lobes so if we have a look at the back here we've got one two three lobes coming out we've got the toes evenly spaced on a hyena we would have had toes that squish together and form a banana shape like that so we know that and we also would have had little claws on the hyena track which we can see are absent here in the soft sand now sometimes you have to be a bit careful because leopards when they walk in very soft sand like this just from the pressure of their toes pushing down sometimes a claw does appear and in this area we also have a hyena which has got three lobes on it so you've got to be a little bit careful around here when you look at these tracks but just the size of this track and the width of it would be leopard straight away so really really nice to see and these were from early last night I saw when we were walking down earlier um, the tracks further up and there was already hyena tracks on top of it so they were definitely from early last night from when we were around when we would have heard him calling so around sort of 11 o'clock midnight that area so so Judy you're wondering how many kilometers a lion or a leopard covers each day well it depends I mean there's there's certain individuals that won't walk that much if we take something like a female you'll find the female leopards tend not to walk very far at all they maybe will cover sort of three four kilometers in a night on a good night when they territory marking whereas the males they tend to move really big distances so Tingana last night he must have covered if I'm just thinking now from where he came to where he's ended up this morning he must have covered close to 10 kilometers last night maybe even more because I don't know his exact route that he's walked but he came from Cheetah Plains which is right down in the southeast he then came up through in Coral into Torchwood up through Torchwood into Juma from Juma he came to the dam he then came down this way he's headed south into Little Gari from Little Gari into Hoffman's so that is a really really long way to, to to walk and the fact that he covers it so quickly is quite amazing but I have heard of even lions in, in the Kalahari area and the desert areas that have walked over 25 kilometers in a night so that really is a very very long way indeed oh, sorry Seb I just thought I saw something here no so I thought I saw some tracks for a slug but there wasn't I apologize it was the wrinkled foot of an elephant which is I suppose a very big difference between the two of them right we're gonna carry on and start heading slowly back towards home with the rain hanging about and while we do that I believe Byron is still on the look out for the leopard well yeah I suppose Tristan I am I'm still looking around for anything really just gonna go through a dip here Sorry, some to lose signal going through those little dips. Um, I'm, 
I'm heading towards uh, Vuyatela Dam just to see if there's any activity around there. I think it might still be a bit early. It's not really warming up just yet, so I don't think there would be too many animals going to drink down there. But you never know. And we were talking about this earlier, and I know Tristan's been mentioning how far leopards can travel. And I do think in weather like this, when it is still cooler, you'd probably find those predators are still moving around. So you never know, we could still bump into something. Um, uh, Preetam, we, oh, I'm trying to think how far we actually drive a day. Um, I would say during a game drive it, it, can, uh, it can vary, but probably looking at well, the amount of hours we are out here, uh, 10 to 20 kilometers on a game drive easily, that, that would be an average drive I'd say. Other drives it's much further especially uh, you, Jamie would have done a lot more today. She went all the way to Cheetah Plains. Don't know if Jamie's still alive. Haven't heard from her for a long time. <laughs> She's probably probably going through Cheetah Plains at the moment. Um, so yeah she would have covered a, a far greater distance. Maybe closer to 30 or 40 kilometers for the morning. So it all depends. Sometimes um, I've taken game drives where we've literally done five kilometers in three hours. Just driving, talking about little things and seeing so much happening close by, bumping into a leopard, spending time with a leopard in a sighting. It, it can happen like that. And other times, like in the, in the Kalahari, up in those areas, you, you drive it's so big it's so huge so you can drive for, for a morning drive 50 or 60 kilometers easily um, to, to go and look for one specific animal it's a very different type of terrain very different game experience because you need to drive so far to look for animals Uh, now speaking about the distance we cover Tristan's apparently making some distance on foot. I wonder how far he's walked today Well Byron the answer is not very far at all We've been spoiled we keep going and bumping into things and so we really haven't walked far at all But while we're talking about walking and walking around in tracks We've got this track here that's just quite interesting so you see there is a sort of swipe that goes across the road like this and all the way onto the other side. Now, if you are a novice tracker, you might not know what this is. So, for you that are out there that maybe has an idea, you can have a look and see, and you can hashtag Safari Live and let me know what you think. But it is quite an easy one. Once you look into the center of this track, you will be able to find what it is. But I want to show you here what is so interesting about this and why I first sort of noticed it. You see that there are scrape lines in this track. So these little scrapes like this which might give you an answer as to what this could be. So, there we go. Remember, hashtag Safari Live, and you can give me the guesses that you have. Now, while we start guessing, let's have a look at a little ant colony that we've got here as well. These guys are really cool. You can see they're busy building. It amazes me the strength of ants. Now, this road that we're on is so compacted by cars, it would have been really difficult to build a nest, but yet these guys have the strength to be able to open it out and be able to then build through the road itself. And they've created a nice hole, and they're busy excavating, and you can see quite a bit of movement inside there. I'm going to just try and get a bit of light in there because it's quite dark this morning. So, Seb, let me get you a bit of light. I'm going to use my phone torch. So, Lara Moore, you say a kill drag, and White Lady 
lizard, you say it is a monitor lizard. And neither of those are correct, I'm afraid. They are not either of those. Now in a drag mark, what you would have found would have been big sort of leg drag so you would have seen the the limbs and it would be a lot more uneven it would almost be a bit more wavy than what you're seeing now or what you saw just now and then with the monitor lizard we would have also had that very wavy tail swipe whereas this is quite a straight line now i was trying to show you over here i say i don't know if you can see that there's these little ants over here and look at how strong they are that particle of soil is almost, well it's a little rock actually, or stone, is probably about three times the size of the little ant carrying it and yet it's still able to pick that up and move it. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely incredible little animals these. If ants were bigger I think humans would have a really tough time in them. So, Miss Sky, you say a snake, and Lara Moore, you say a tortoise. Again, I'm afraid neither of you are correct. I'm going to show you what it is because this is quite a tough one. But, f so Seb, if you can come here, then I'll show you exactly what's happened here. Now, this animal that was here started over here. Now you can imagine it walking. It is an elephant. And what this is, is its trunk that is dragged across the road. And these little scrapes that you're seeing here, are the little fine hairs that come on an elephant's trunk. Lorenzo, you guessed an elephant, so well done Lorenzo. But that is exactly what it is. The little fine hairs of the elephant's trunk as it's dragged. And here is the footprint. And that was the key in the shot, was that's where the footprint is. You can see the wrinkled nature of the soil here. And there's the little toe as it's dragged forward. So this was one of the young elephants that came across and dragged its trunk as it went across the road. But a really cool track and this would have caught out quite a few guides if especially if when you do your sort of tracking test if the assessor had come and rubbed out that footprint it would have been quite a tough one. So well done to those who did guess and it was not the easiest track to do. Now we're going to carry on on our way home. Like I say the storm is blowing in and so we don't want to get too wet out here and while we do that let's go across to Byron who I think is still searching for the leopard but I'm not sure where he is. I've just got to Voyatella Dam, Tristan, and there's three lovely water bucks standing on the dam wall. And all youngsters, all young water buck, and two young males, uh, three young males. <laughs> nice to see them there. They're beautiful antelope, the water buck. They are quite nice. Senzo was telling me he thinks that. The, these are one of his favorite waterbuck um, or favorite antelope because he says the the faces look so feminine. He says that it looks like they've got makeup on them. <laughs> the eyelashes. I didn't hear what track that was that uh, Tristan had. Um, that he was. I don't know. If, did he tell us what it was or? Oh, an elephant's trunk that was dragging it in the sand. Oh, okay, okay, good one. Um, often people see that, and the first thing I think is it's a snake. But um, if it's dragged it, sometimes they just dab the sand or pick up the sand with their trunk. more time you spend out here the more time you get to see different tracks and learn and I think it's it's fascinating I really do Rakesh well the difference between Impala and waterbuck. That is a waterbuck that you can see over there. Grey coloration, darker legs, bit of a white marking around the neck and then a very prominent white ring around the rump. And then to our left, those are Impala. So Rakesh, there we go. Those are Impala. See the difference? The impala also much smaller antelope. Only the males have horns. The same with the waterbuck though, only the males have horns. So those are a few males, but you can see the 
very clear color difference. The horn structure is different, different shape, but much smaller antelope compared to the waterbuck. But they've got that brownish color, white on the belly. Very different. So, good question, Rakesh. Easy to answer because we had both antelope species right here with us. <laughs> so those are just some impala. His waterbuck is still very happy, just standing in the front, front of the or front of us in the road, not not keen on moving. I wonder if they've gone down to drink, or if they're still planning on going down to drink. I'm not going to disturb them. I'm not going to try driving him closer. There's no need. So, Judy, just um, in answer to your question, how do we know with the um, waterbuck are male or female. I, I was mentioning earlier, like the impala, only the males have horns, the females do not. So, easiest thing is just to look for those horns. Sometimes I get uh, guests saying, oh, they look like um, the reindeer back home. They do almost. I think it's those shaggy coats. Uh, look reindeer-like, I suppose. So, Tatum, you asked, how big do antlers grow? So, Tatum, the best way I can explain this is to me. Let me actually get get a book and do this properly. Hold on a second. Um, and Tatum, actually, the, the correct term is, is horns. Now, w the difference between uh, the difference between antelope and deer is antelope have horns, which we have seen that grow throughout their lifetime. They never lose them. And the deer have got antlers that you asked about. The antlers grow annually and then they are shed again and the next year they grow back whereas the antelope never lose their horns or antlers so their horns no, they don't have antlers um let me just find a picture of water back quickly uh, just to give you an idea here we go okay firstly there's the picture of can you see this is that all right there's a picture of an adult water buck male um, over there with some females. You see the females do not have horns. Now, if these antelope break their horns off, they do not grow back. As I said, they don't grow back. Then, and sometimes you do see antelope with single horns. But the horns vary depending on the animal. Now, one of the species of antelope with, uh, with the longest horns is this one right there. Look at that. That is called the oryx or the Hemsbok. Now, we don't get that here. We get that up in the Kalahari. In the desert area, other parts of, of Africa, a bit of N Namibia, um, a lot in Namibia, Botswana, there are some, but we don't get them this part of South Africa. They prefer semi-arid to desert area. So that's the Gemsbok or the Oryx, of long, long horns, very straight long horns. This is probably my favorite ant antelope. I love seeing them. Really beautiful. And then, uh, then you also have a nice example would be the kudu. Now look at that male kudu with that, those long spiral horns that twist and curl. So also very different. So every antelope has a different type of horn. And there are also some antelope where male and female have got horns. Now these ones that I showed you, the kudu and the waterbuck, only the male have horns. The oryx, however, that one that I showed you earlier, the male and the female have horns. And then we also have um, the wildebeest. They both. Ah, oh, there we go. So, Laura, you were asking what antelope species have, where the females also have horns. So, those oryx, the chemspok, um, the wildebeest, wildebeest, what else, I think? Uh, springbuck, springbuck is one, where the male and female have horns. There we go. Slightly different shape, but the springbuck, both male and female have horns.
So there we go. So there are a few other little species, but in this area that I can think of, it's probably the wildebeest. Uh, what else? I think that's it that I can think of for now in this area that the male and female have got horns in the antelope species. Yeah, I think I'm stuck on that one for now. <laughs> and that's it. But um, I hope that gives you a better understanding of horns, antlers, the vari variation of length and size also depends on the antelope. Ah, right, now we were speaking about the wildebeest. Tristan has managed to find some. We have indeed, and so like you said, there are certain antelope that have male and female with horns, and the wildebeest is one of them. So you can see all of these individuals have horns, the varying different ones that are through the herd, so even the young ones, they've got a few horns. And you can hear that they're snorting a little bit at me. I don't know if you can hear it over the wind. It's very windy on quarantine at the moment. But they are snorting at me because they've seen me come from behind a bush. And that's why they're all worried. But they're starting to slowly relax. You can see one or two of them are starting to lie down now. They're fairly, fairly chilled. But these guys will probably spend most of the day here today. The nice thing about today is that with this cold wind that's blowing and this overcast conditions and sort of rainy weather, quarantine is a perfect place for them to spend time. They don't have to worry about the heat of the sun. They've got a nice open section that if there are any predators that could be active during the day, I know Byron was discussing how the predators will often move in weather like this, that they will be able to then see those predators and still graze and have nice grass to eat. So it's a perfect place for the wildebeest to spend the day. And you can see they're not very happy with me at the moment. There's lots of shouting, so they're being not as friendly as the elephant or the giraffe and zebra have been this morning, but still so cool to see them. And they're getting relaxed slowly but surely. They're not nearly as relaxed as what the McCurdy herdy was, but um, they are starting to get there. The more we kind of spend time doing bushwalks and walking into these areas, the more this wildebeest will start to relax. So, Von Shi, you're wondering if these wildebeest are dangerous. Well, no, they're not. So, on foot, they're actually more scared of us than anything else. So, if I had to walk probably closer, you'd find that they'd all start to trot off a little bit and start to move away from me. Um, they're quite nervous of people, so they're not too dangerous in terms of us on foot or even in a vehicle. Um, although, I had a friend who was um, south in the Sabi Sands and he was following um, lions hunting one night and it was actually the Styx Pride with the Majingalans and they were hunting and they, uh, were, he was following the lions and shining a spotlight to try and see where the lions were going and they went into this kind of hunting mode and so he sort of shone his light to the left and these lions exploded out and they were chasing these wildebeest and the wildebeest ran straight at the car and one male ended up jumping onto the bonnet and its horns got stuck in the steering wheel and it actually bent the whole steering wheel and kicked him and he had bruises all over his chest and his stomach and then one of the lions managed to grab that wildebeest and pull it off the car which is a scary, scary story so I suppose in that case a wildebeest can be dangerous if there's a lion attached to it and it's on top of your chest then yes it would be very dangerous but otherwise no on foot like this it's perfectly okay and it's not really something we have to worry about too much they will really just watch us and not be too worried about what goes on now from a fairly relaxed animal and one that's not too dangerous to one that is can be very dangerous although this morning they gave us a real show we're gonna go across to Jamie who's got some beautiful big animals to show you Beautiful big animals indeed. I'm happy. I think any drive is a fantastic drive if it's shared in the company of elephants. So whilst we might not have much luck or have had much luck on cheetah plains, we have found a lovely herd of elephants to spend the rest of our drive with. Munching away on a bush willow. A beautiful girl. And in situations like this, perfectly relaxed, not dangerous at all, just peaceful. In fact, she even looks as though she kind of wants to have a nap. No. Still eating. And Dave, do you know what I've spotted off to the left of her? An Inkanyeni. Oh, oh my goodness, look, it's an Inkanyeni. And there's another Inkanyeni off to the left. So many Inkanyenis. <laughs> so many Inkanyenis. How exciting is that? Inkanyeni, 
a marula tree, and one disappearing elephant. Ah. Now, Lance, while we look at our lovely female, you want to know whether or not female elephants will ever fight with each other. Yes, occasionally they do. Um, not serious fights. They tend to be more a lot of trumpeting, a lot of noise, a bit of pushing and shoving. Uh, it's not too serious. Um, generally speaking, it's the older females disciplining the younger ones and just essentially being a little bit crabby about invasions of personal space, especially if they have a calf with them. They tend to get irritable, especially if somebody comes waltzing into them without really looking where they're going. They do bump into each other every now and again. And then the females might trumpet, they'll push a little bit. But essentially that's all that happens. So they're not particularly aggressive creatures, they're not territorial in any way. So the fights between females are rare indeed. I've seen them push and shove just a little bit. And occasionally when you get encounters between herds, sometimes there's a little bit of tension. I don't know if tension's the right word. It's just the females reacquainting themselves with each other. And there's lots of sniffing that goes on. And sometimes there's excited body language. Ears out, heads up, a bit of a run forward and backwards and jostling with the calves and so on. But really, beyond that, they don't particularly have any disagreements. We did, of course, see that amazing sighting where a female pushed over a much younger elephant. We don't know why. We don't know if it was because it was an invasion of space, perhaps with her calf. It was Benjamin Button's mother. And she turned around and knocked a younger elephant right off its feet and then pinned it down onto the ground. And there was much screaming and squealing. And to this day, I don't know what provoked her. Now, they can get protective. Generally, when you hear screams and squawks from elephants during the night or even during the day, a lot of the time it's just because it's other elephants upset. It's the elephants upsetting each other. Bumper bashings, sort of, in the elephant world. Of course, as per my luck this morning, the elephants are now gone. They have completely vanished. It's astounding how such a bulky animal can disappear. I think it's disappeared behind Inkanyeni over there. Ah, sigh. I'll try for another view, but I don't think we're going to manage. I think they're going to disappear. This is quite a thick, quite a large block. And block is the section between roads. And since they've vanished off, it has been an elephant luck day. And Byron, of course, spent most of his morning with them. Yeah, we had a lovely sight on those elephant earlier. I don't know if it's the same elephant, Jamie, um, that you that you're seeing, perhaps. Um, but now we have a red-billed hornbill that's balancing on a branch, balancing in the wind. The wind's picked up a little bit. You might actually be able to hear it. I'm looking forward to the birding competition this afternoon, but I think I'm going to be on foot, so it might be a bit, bit difficult to get these birds on camera while we're walking, but we'll do our best. We'll just make Taylor walk. <laughs> Taylor's probably still Taylor's probably still fast asleep. She got to rest this morning. Well, I hope she's making breakfast. <laughs> Getting out to the clearings now, so we'll see what we can find out here. some impala just in front of us. Now Angie you asked what is my favorite African nature sound? Um, Angie I think w without a doubt um, it has to be a lion roar. Um, I mean there are a lot of a lot of sounds that that I absolutely love 
there are a number of sounds that I love in the bush um, bird calls that, that hyena whoop Angie that you said you love so much that is a lovely sound too it's nice to hear and uh, the jackal the jackal do a wonderful like a howling scream almost and that's the best way I can describe it um, I can't do it unfortunately um, but the, the jackal call in the distance sometimes is quite nice a black back jackal um, but uh, nothing beats a lion roar especially especially if you're fortunate enough to to hear it close up um, it's incredible I, I've, I've been lucky that I've heard a lion roar many many times and I think I'm trying to think now I think the first time I heard a lion roar close up was uh, was when I started guiding at Londolozi and I mean we'd seen lions many times before growing up and I always heard them in the distance but never got close to seeing it and when the, the first time on you know the first time I had this male lion roaring close to me it was the most amazing sound it really uh, I mean it it does they say it goes right through you but it does it's such a powerful sound so I think that that has to be my favorite and if you're lucky you get three or four males calling together close by I mean your whole vehicle vibrates it's uh, it's incredibly loud No, I've given you my favorite noise. I wonder what Jamie and Tristan's favorite sounds are. Let's go check with Jamie first. My favorite sound. It's a difficult one. I mean, Byron's absolutely correct. It's a lion roar is a truly astounding thing. And it's something very primal about it. I'm going to say, though... In terms of sounds you hear in the early evening or the early morning, something we don't hear that frequently here, jackals. Black-backed jackals, because to me it sounds like they're singing. And the knowledge, it's, it's kind of like wolves, the way that they all set each other off and they all start calling at the same time. I love the sounds of jackals calling. It was almost knocked off the top pedestal because Steph set his ringtone to jackals calling which meant that every time his phone rang we heard the jackals and that you know like an over listened to song had the potential to be to to take detract from the magic of a jackals call but it hasn't dave what about yours an ellie rumble, an ellie rumble. that's also an awe-inspiring sound i thought about that as well that deep 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 rumble when they talk to each other the feeling where you you actually basically feel it rather than actively hear it that's also a stunning sound and the pearl spotted owl it's pearl spotted owlet whistle he's beautiful sure there's too many to choose from elephants rumbling i love the sound of a ground hornbill cuckoo 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 Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Oh, you want to know how loud is a lion's roar? Around about 110 decibels is the answer to that. I have recently learned that. I've always thought of it as very loud, and I've known it's very loud. But recently on our live safaris, I got asked that, and then everybody shared that information with me. So at one meter away, 110 to around about 115 decibels is how loud a lion's roar is. Very loud. And it travels very far, particularly on a cold morning where sound waves travel further. You can hear it many miles away. It is an awe-inspiring sound, but it's not my favorite. I didn't, but did, did Paul say bacon sizzling? Bacon sizzling. And Paul, I agree. Bacon sizzling is a fantastic noise and happiness is bacon I can hear and smell from all the way across the open area of quarantine, which means the foot gets a little bit hairier. 
Uh, just a quick reminder, we will be changing our times. Keep an eye out on the blog. On the 1st of May, our sunset safari will shift forward half an hour fast, so half an hour earlier. So keep an eye on our blogs and we'll keep you updated. Thank you, Dave. It's time to go and eat some bacon. Thank you to Megan and to Alice in Final Control. Most importantly, a big thank you to all of you. Don't forget, time's changing 1st of May only for the Sunset Safari. We will keep you updated. Until I see you again in a few short hours, have a fantastic evening or day wherever you are.